now we move into what could really be said to be the final stretch of the World Water Week. And as you know, when you're sort of nearing the goal post, you will need to speed up. And that is what we're going to do. This year we had an enormous interest in the World Water Week. Last year we had 53 seminar sessions and we decided we cannot do it. We have to reduce. So this year we only had 60. And we also had a record number of total events, over 100. And in order to capture all this and try to get sort of the essence out of it, we've had the rapporteurs. And I would like the lead rapporteurs to start preparing themselves for coming up on the stage. And in the meantime, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the junior rapporteurs. We have had four teams on four different themes, and each team consisted of two lead rapporteurs and five junior rapporteurs, and they've been attending every session during the World Water Week. So the sessions that you didn't have time to go to, they were there. The sessions you had time to go to, they were there as well. And they have captured all the interesting ideas they come out of this. They have distilled it into conclusions, and they, have, they are now ready to present the findings for you. But please, let us give a big hand for the World Water Week Junior Rapporteurs. Please stand up. Okay. And then I, I'd like to introduce to you the first team of the lead rapporteurs, and that is uh, on the theme Achieving Good Water and Food Governance, and that is Bogajan Bailey and Juliet Christian Smith. Please, have a seat. <laughs> I think you all can have a seat. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're too polite. And the second team on ensuring human and environmental health with Danka Thalmeinerova and Line Gordon. And a third team on establishing water and food equity with Melinda Fon Sandel and Doen Sewell. And last, but absolutely not least, the team working with building a water-wise economy. That is Marielle kenter weichel and Kathleen Dominic. And we are going to, to let the four teams present in a sequence. And after that, we are hoping for a good discussion with all the teams. So at first, we would like uh, Bogajan and uh, Juliette to present your findings. Yeah, over yes, there. please. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, under the first group, the Achieving Good Water and Food Governance team, we, were, we are seven reporters and attended in total 42 sessions side events and seminars, um, consumed 12 kilogram of salmon fish, 20 kilogram of potato, five kilogram of salads, 50 grams of herring fish, we have stated there, and absolutely increased the per capita consumption of coffee in Sweden. <laughs> we did our best in drawing the conclusions and here are they. We want to thank our junior rapporteurs who we could not have done this without. Um, and I do want to apologize before we even begin because this is very high level, obviously. We went to many different sessions and we're only able to report back on a few of the, the main ideas and um, we apologize for the oversights uh, that are inherent. So what's new? Well, we saw a lot of ideas, um, some of which were not new, persistent problems, and we tried to really just define those that seemed like new tools and uh, practices in the governance sector. Uh, one of which, FAO, OECD, EU Water Initiative, all talked about prioritizing investments, so new indices to prioritize funding in the water and wash sectors. 
we saw a shift away from the Millennium Development Goals as we achieve those towards new sustainable development goals. And as the speaker this morning mentioned, moving beyond uh, the MDGs into including other aspects like women in governance. There was much focus on, on multi-stakeholder partnerships, civil society, governments, neglected stakeholders, and the private sector had a large a representation here this, this year. And we saw that in the European Water Partnerships uh, presentations, the UN CEO Water Mandate, and other uh, Water Resources Group and World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Many of these talked about creativity, creating shared value, understanding shared risks and benefits that goes beyond just a single corporate social responsibility program in a single uh, business or private sector entity. We also saw the importance of standard development to allow comparison and communication across sectors and between actors. One interesting uh, development is a new ISO standard for water footprinting which will uh, begin to make distinctions between gross and net water footprints and also footprints from water secure versus water scarce sources. There was a big focus on knowledge management, so embracing technology, partnerships between model developers and users, creating end user interfaces that work for people uh, who are going to be responding to droughts such as early warning systems. New ways to collect data, crowdsourcing, texting, SMS technology, um, and new internet portals, ways to share data. For instance, the Water Action Hub and Agripedia. And finally, we heard about the need for governance to become more flexible, equitable, and resilient um, in, in light of changes to changes in complexities and uncertainties in the future. And we need more examples of successes here. We did hear from Tanzania, Mexico, and Ethiopia about some of their work, but it's important to learn from these successes and are there aspects that can be scaled up and transferred to other areas. Well, there is a lot need to do um, to achieve those new approaches. Discussions were initially uh, focused on developing those indexes where the investments should go, which are like national investment potential index, institutional and policy indexes. Following that, on the sustainable development goals in, comple in complementary with the MDGs, uh, the best result will be handled with the participation of all stakeholders, including government, private sector, and community-based organizations. Uh, following that, there is a need in promoting the collaboration, the collective action between public and private institutions to and improve the productivity of water usage. And um, there were these discussions, there were discussions about the virtual water, footprint water, and embedded water, and to understand each other better, we need to develop a standard and a common understanding on water footprint metrics. Um, there is a lot of there are lots of changes in the technology which can allow us to share the data, the information, and who is doing what and where. So, using the recent technology in collecting and sharing data is is needed. And finally that everybody knows increasing water productivity can address the, the food security problem and secure water sources and ecosystems. We need to work hard on increasing that. And finally, what's next? This is our last slide. Um, Obviously, maintaining water is a key political priority. Um, SDGs and the EU Water Initiative spoke about the importance of keeping this on the radar screen for governments in the future and keeping it on donors' uh, radar as well. Uh, you can't treasure what you don't measure. Obviously, governance relies on science and data to make informed decisions. So several of the sessions talked about the persistent need for better data collection um, and metrics, performance metrics, to understand water governance interventions and their uh, potential to be scaled up. Yes. 
And on participatory technology and data collection, well, there are several methods, but we, just to give an example, there is this water action hub, which is uh, sharing all this necessary information. And following that, um, we need to engage stakeholders and, uh, prom and encourage them for the collective action to, to tackle this serious issue of sharing the water sources. We have observed during these sessions that there are, there are serious activities and, uh, and bringing all these stakeholders together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, both Bogajan and Juliet. It's great to see that you still have some blood left in your coffee streams. <laughs> That is a usual disease here during the World Water Week that might affect you. I must also apologize, I forgot. I was supposed to tell you also about the format that we have chosen for these presentations. In order to make the task that we have given these lead rapporteurs even more impossible, we asked them to focus on what is new, so what has come out of the World Water Week. What is needed, what do we need to do to achieve a desirable world in the future? And what next addresses, okay, what do we do right now? What is our next step? So we want to see what is sort of new on the agenda, where do we want to go and how can we do that, and what is the next step that we can take? So that's how we have sort of put this all together. And now I would like to introduce or allow Lina and Danka to talk about ensuring human and environmental health. Thank you, Jens. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we had uh, one very specific team focusing on ensuring human and environmental health. Uh, none of the members of our group is epidemiologists, but uh, they did a great job, junior reporters. And uh, because we are working with water or studying the water sector, we are well aware of uh, consequences when the water is polluted. And agriculture, and pro food production sectors are one, those who significantly contribute to contamination, environmental pollution, and degradation. So in our sessions, our contribution and share was the same as previous group, uh, high consumption of coffee, uh, was to hunt for those stories, uh, to find the sessions and uh, address uh, the issues specifically from the point of view ensuring human and environmental health. A uh, second problem which we had in group was uh, to define as we were guided what's new and what is needed. And sometimes what I understood is needed, Lina said, no, it's new, <laughs> so, or, or vice versa. So we will see how we will tackle that. I will tell you a story what is new, and she has many more slides of what is needed. And then we will try to summarize it. So this is our team. Once more, thank you. Uh, and we had a hard time how to make these bullets in very structured form and to give a clear message. What we found is a new understanding. Management of water resources cannot be done by poor water professionals. Management of land cannot be done by sole land users. These were findings which we found. Those most sessions which we visited, they were conveyed by organizations that contribute to each other. For example, FAO with AMCO, Ministry with the bank, a Research Institute with NGO. Also, that is a stolen statement. Most of these statements are stolen because we are reporting back. We, not, we should not supposed to make our statements. The past cannot be used to predict the future. That was mentioned by FAO representative. Well, this, is, this refers predominantly to, to difficulties to predict climatic conditions, but these are needed for decisions of water sector as well as uh, agriculture sector. And maybe that sentence is also true uh, for prediction of trends regarding water environmental degradation. And uh, the last what uh, we saw that the, the new understanding is that does not separate development and climate change. 
So development needs to be taken in parallel with consequences of climate change. As a summary of that, what we saw new and very promising, it's a shift in a global agenda. So we, are start, we started to speak in integrated discussions, food, security, water, environments. And, and many times on the session we saw that the, uh, the representative of the production side uh, referred to the environmental quality and vice versa. Second bullet, which what is new, is uh, about new research was done. These two points probably are not new. They are practicing very long uh, the water saving techniques and smallholder private, uh, private agriculture. But what we found is a deep dive and deep thinking about the consequences of what we are doing. So in case of water saving technique, technical innovations, yes, they exist. They are applied in the developed world. They are piloting in developing world. However, as we heard in the session, will they solve the issue of efficient use of water? There was a research done that, yes, they could contribute, but we have to be sure that the said water will return back to the environment. As the studies which we attended, uh, they showed that uh, its so-called rebound effect was research, and the said water was immediately turned for the expansion of the additional food production, and, and the final consumption of the water increased. It's a very interesting research. And the second is, that there was a, after the industrialized uh, agriculture, then there was a shift to smallholder agriculture, and it was very promising, especially in developing world, that will contribute to solve the malnutrition and the hunger. Yes, however, again, the research showed that unregulated uh, smallholder agriculture will use the water in a not sustainable way and could lead to over abstraction and runoff and pollution of the water. So now I will put it to Lina. She has more things to tell you what is needed. <clears throat> okay, so what is needed? First, we need to create incentives to produce more, pr not to produce more, but to produce more food on existing agricultural lands and with existing water use. So what does this mean? Well, first, we already heard, we need to uh, increase water use efficiency. And we can do that across the whole spectrum of rain-fed to irrigated green to blue water. Second, as we also have heard today in the summary here, waste, food waste, post-harvest losses actually uh, consume a lot of water. Uh, about this number I heard this week is about waste e equivalent of 25% of the irrigation use. Uh, third, I don't know if you know, but actually 45% of crop water requirements goes to feed today. So by having much more nutrient sensitive agriculture, we can both increase health and relieve pressure on, on the environment. Not only does feed consume 45% of the world's uh, crop water use, Livestock is also the fastest growing agricultural subsector. It stands for 40% of global uh, GDP, and one third of our globe uh, land area is used for livestock. Uh, also, fisheries and aquaculture are two sectors truly linked to human health and nutrition because they provide very important animal proteins for some of the world's poorest communities. Despite this, and despite that those sectors both are so important for human health and important for the environment, it's been actually remarkably little about this during the Water Week. So we are calling for more uh, consideration of livestock and fish in action plans on water, food, and environment issues. Third point. Um, there is a strong ongoing trend, we heard that clearly through the week, that's dr largely driven by farmers themselves to adopt new types of small-scale agriculture water investments uh, technologies. And during the week, we also heard uh, suggestions of how to unlock the potential for business to invest more in this, uh, business that previously have been investing more in the formal irrigation sector, to focus more on the smallholder um, water management communities. So we want to be able to leverage these ongoing trends, what farmers are already doing themselves and have pre preference for. 
Part of this is also about closing the sanitation loop and using human waste as part of input in the production. And in order to ensure human health, we need to be aware and build capacity of how to deal with the health risks in relation to that. Upscaling smallholder agricultural practices are not easy, and it also often can lead to a, quite a, uh, a lot of unregulated water extraction and uh, nutrient use, and we need to be aware of that when we are upscaling these practices. practices. The two final points deals with our capacity to weigh different uh, difficult trade-offs among food security, water use, environment and health. And we have seen the development of and presentation of old and new tools, water footprinting for water, ecosystem services, bundles for ecosystem issues, green water accounting for monetary things, LCA analysis trying to take a whole view picture of this. Uh, and we need more of these systematic tools, but we also need to be aware of the high costs it has of finding data for all these tools. Um, finally, many, many of these trade-offs occur at the landscape, and landscapes are larger than the field where agricultural production takes place. They're different, and they're different from the basin scale where many water professionals operate. We thus need new dynamic bridging institutions that can enable management of multiple ecosystem services across landscape and link actors between different sectors. These institutions need to be able to assess, monitor and force, but also to learn, to adapt, to deal with the complexity and the messiness that often occurs at the landscape scale. Uh, there is a uh, last slide which we have. What's next? And uh, these, again, are taken direct recommendations which we heard from the, uh, from the sessions. And uh, it was uh, very often mentioned that we need to strengthen institutional capacities to deal with environmental consequences of investments. This year it was uh, also the issue or discuss on uh, foreign investments in land and indirectly or directly in water and land grabbing. Then uh, what next is continue, do not stop to train farmers in good agriculture practices. Also focus on environmental and human health. This is a message for donors. Please don't be tired to again to finance the capacity development program one year and year. Don't step out after the few years of the, your contribution. Then also what was very strong, show us stories on the ground. It's fine that we have frameworks. It's fine that we have global discussions. We need to have stories on the ground and to think how to upscale them. And the last, that is uh, uh, the statement which was said, uh, I should uh, quote, it was, uh, what, you took my paper? Yeah, okay. Mrs. Egal from FAO, okay, that's okay. <laughs> the Cooperation for Sustainable Diets, Water and Nutrition. This will be a common agenda for the next year. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Danke and Lina. We appreciate it. It's not so easy to cover all those different things in so few minutes, but uh, you will also be able to get back with a written report later on, as we all know. Uh, by that, I'd like to give the floor, I believe it's Darren, who's going to present, and Melina, take all the questions then, or you'll be there. <laughs> Thank you very much. We had the uh, Establishing Water and Food Equity session. Again, we had fantastic junior rapporteurs and great discussions. People went to all the sessions and we reacted afterwards, which I found one of the most stimulating parts, of, besides all the heavy work <laughs> of being a rapporteur. In our internal discussions, I have uh, greatly dominated the discussion, so now I thought we will let Darren get a word in edgewise. <laughs> Thanks very much, Karen. Thanks very much, uh, Melinda. Um, and it's a pleasure to be able to give you some feedback from, uh, from this theme. Um, in the spirit of uh, uh, starting with some disclaimers, uh, like many others, um, we wouldn't have been able to do this without uh, the team that was behind us. So thanks very much for all the 
junior rapporteurs and a special recognition for Melinda in the, in the uh, protective way in which she encouraged all of us to work together in a team and that was, that was wonderful. Uh, my second disclaimer is, is just to say that it was extremely difficult to boil down the 75 sessions that we covered as a team into uh, four slides in six minutes. Um, so, you know, what you see here is a signal of the direction of travel that we've picked up from, from the sessions and obviously the detail that we uh, will outline in the written report that's coming up. Uh, we, uh, uh, we didn't do a very good job because we started with the what's not new um, uh, rather than the what's new um, question. Um, but we thought that this was important just to say that you know, the issue of equity is, is not new. It's been in uh, Stockholm Water Week many times before, and that's right and proper. And so really what we were doing during this year's uh, theme was building on uh, and complementing the work of, of previous years. So it's good that equity is not a new theme, uh, but we'd certainly seen an elaboration, particularly around some of the uh, case studies uh, for addressing equity issues uh, and around some of the methodologies that exist out there. So we, we've, we've heard a lot about equity analysis this week, we've heard a lot about exclusion analysis, and also a lot of detail on participatory methodologies. Coming back to task in hand, so what's new? We, again here, we've picked out three fairly high level uh, points for you to consider. Uh, the one was around, uh, the first was around this, this idea of the nexus between particular topics in the sector. So we were seeing particular benefits that were deriving from the interaction between, say, wash and nutrition. We learned about the fact that of the 555 million children in, in low and developing countries, some 32% of those are stunted, and how better sanitation and water supply can have a significant impact on their, uh, their health gains and their height to age uh, scores. So we heard a lot about those interactions between these different parts of the subsector. We heard this morning from Lakshmi Puri about the relationship between gender and agriculture. And I think that that was a really useful thing for us to be bumping up against. There's a lot of value and richness in, in that synergistic uh, interaction. I think the second point and a trend that I'm beginning to see in our sector as a whole is a much greater uh, level of analysis behind the work that we're doing. A real shift, certainly on the water and sanitation side, and I'm sure on, on the food side, towards a different level of analysis, a much, a much more rigorous and academic perspective on the work that we're doing. And I think that's very welcome uh, as we feed into the sort of policy dialogues which are, which are ongoing. We'd heard a lot during this week, for instance, about the economic analysis behind sanitation and water. We'd heard a lot about new forms of bottleneck analysis as a way to help our implementation moving forward. And I think that, that was, uh, that's a very welcome trend and development. And the third point here, which I think is related, is that we see a trend towards much more rigorous design of incentives in programming for equity outcomes. That sounds rather, rather like a mouthful, but in essence, a good example of that was presented by the Water and Sanitation Program, uh, looking at the conditional cash transfers approach in Peru, a way in which cash incentives can be used uh, for the poor to remove some of the demand side constraints that they have. So a way for us to consider incentives uh, to drive much stronger outcomes uh, around equity. On the what's needed side, um, I think that uh, we, we felt that that trend, as I just mentioned, about increasing evidence-based decision-making needs to continue. So we would be arguing, and I think we heard this from many groups, for an even more stringent analysis of the priorities over resource use land, water and finance. And that certainly needs to be something that is uh, mediated across different stakeholders. On the food equity side, as Melinda's been encouraging me to, to, to speak to the group about, it would be good to focus more on who will be doing the producing of the food rather than on the technical questions of how to produce more food. I think the second point here around what's needed is in relation to the sustainable development goals, we've heard a lot about that this week, is to have a much higher resolution, a much higher degree of detail on, uh, in those targets with respect to equity considerations. 
And I think there's been some very useful moves forward, particularly on the water side that I can speak to. We see within the new targets, uh, goals and indicators that are emerging a much higher degree of understanding of wealth quintiles and their involvement in those indicators. That will certainly drive change moving forward if those proposals are adopted within the sustainable development goal process. And the third point here, coming back to the food equity side, is we need a much broader understanding of the food waste and equity implications. I think a couple of other speakers have mentioned this already, but if we look at the, uh, the, the uh, waste losses from on-farm production, it's something in the order of 20, 20 to 30 percent of food is lost already before it gets to the market. That certainly needs to change. On the what's next, Two points which we thought had some generational impact. Uh, we've heard of these before, so this is not necessarily new, but it's certainly still needed. The first being, how do we think afresh about the capacity strengthening that we have for the next generation of professionals? Certainly on the water side, one of the things that we have a habit of doing is retrofitting skills because university curricula are not fit for purpose. So how can we think fresh about that approach? How can we involve professional associations and other tertiary organizations in producing more progressive and more appropriate uh, professionals working in the sector? Good examples of this would be around gender sensitive or friendly wash facilities uh, or around uh, a focus on reuse and recycling approaches and technologies or around multiple use approaches. And our last point, again one which has been echoed elsewhere, is if we want to achieve the generational change that we are all aiming for, we really need to be looking at the political momentum that's being gained internationally and sustain that at the national level so that we can drive through policy and see through implementation. I think if that's coupled to what we foresee as a much more harmonized set of targets and indicators and a coherent monitoring and evaluation framework going forward, we will have a self-propelling cycle uh, rather than a vicious circle as at the moment. That concludes the summary from our thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren and Melinda. Uh, already now I see a trend. You have all been saying that sort of the need to channel the world's newfound interest in sort of water and food and also maybe in sanitation. We need to channel that towards constructive collaboration instead of disruptive disagreements. If that trend continues with the final presentation, <laughs> we'll see. Please, Kathleen. Well, good morning. Um, my um, colleagues and, and myself, I had the privilege of covering the theme of building a water-wise economy. And maybe surprisingly, we were the only team who didn't come up with some interesting statistics about the number of sessions covered or coffee uh, drunk or maybe uh, hours without sleep or nights without sleep. But uh, Quite surprising for someone working with the business sector and an economist, but um, we think that maybe you, you hear enough uh, statistics from economists uh, generally. Um, I'd like to start again by recognizing our really excellent team of junior rapporteurs uh, who did a phenomenal job, and I'll just pause here for uh, anybody in the audience who is looking to recruit um, really motivated, uh, smart, young professionals or who have really interesting intern ship opportunities. Um, those are great leads. <laughs> okay, for our theme, we tried to pick up on a couple of uh, themes uh, about what's new. And to start with, um, one of the things that we heard a lot about is um, a new water scarcity driven by a demand shift with increased volatility, both physical volatility like floods and droughts, extreme weather events, and market volatility like the recent global financial crisis. Um, all of this is driving a new water scarcity. We heard the example in the high-level panel debate, debate about the food price spikes in 2007 and 8, which raised concerns about growing resource constraints, 
combined with financial crisis, which resulted in freeing up lots of capital that was looking for new investment opportunities, and these trends combining and contributing to an acceleration of investment in agricultural land and water. The second point that we felt was new was this discussion about the value of water. And this year we heard the debate going, I think, beyond the more simple dichotomy of seeing water, water either as an economic good or not. And we're starting to hear recognition that water has an economic value, but also social and cultural values. And the understanding of the economic value of water is a really complex task. Water can be both a public good and a private good. It has significant non-market values, like the value of ecosystem services. It has multiple uses. It varies in time and space. Centuries ago, Adam Smith, famous economist, um, hinted at these complexities in the water and diamond paradox, which is, which is well known when he noted that diamonds have a high value in exchange, but hardly any value in use whereas water has hardly any value in exchange, but nothing is more useful. So opening up the discussion here is a really important uh, theme. The next one is optimizing the value chain. Uh, in many of the discussions, we heard repeatedly that we've got to move beyond a focus only on the production side and look across the agro food value chain to reduce food waste and inefficiencies. Um, finally, we saw an increasing uptake of tools to manage water risks. The activities of the private sector is a great illustration of this increasing uptake, which is driven by growing demand from investors for disclosure and information about exposure to water risks. So what's needed? We, uh, we needed two slides to talk about what's needed. I'll go through this first one here. So uh, several things we identified as themes coming out of the sessions that we participated in. One is that we, as a community, really need to rethink some key water concepts. Um, green, blue, gray water, water footprinting, uh, quality and quantity, and um, how, how we address extreme weather events in some of the, the risk assessment tools out there. Uh, in particular, I'd like just to give as an example water footprint. Uh, we heard uh, a lot of themes emerging about how we need to better incorporate green and gray water into risk evaluations. So also identified was the need to broaden the approach that uh, we as a community are taking on um, going beyond just looking at biophysical and engineering factors, but really including uh, the, the social or softer sciences in our approaches to addressing some of our water challenges, um, the, the economics and the, the policy aspects of things. Uh, finally, uh, at least finally for my slide, we have some more needs identified, but we also uh, identified the need to strengthen decision making to help reduce risk and improve resilience. Um, and, and one of the ways, uh, just uh, as an example, that we identified coming out as a theme of need is harmonization of definitions. And I think we've heard about this uh, several times this morning in the concluding remarks um, on key terms such as adaptation, nexus, and, and valuation. Great, and it doesn't end there, of course. There's always more to do. Um, we wouldn't disappoint you by breaking the trend on collaboration and cooperation. Everyone seems to agree on this point, comes up in all, all discussions, really, almost without exception. Um, clearly, it's needed across sectors, levels of governance, from transboundary to local level, between public and private. It's important um, not only to identify ways to share benefits, um, but it's important to uh, allow actors to build predictability. Um, it requires building trust. That came across very clearly, having a process. And fruitful collaboration can be helped by building on shared knowledge and not just around shared interests. The question here going forward um, is how do we do this better? And that's a question for next year's uh, World Water Week. The next point here is about um, recognizing that there's a need for economic analysis that's demand-driven, um, delivered to the right people at the right time. 
So there's often a need to repackage economic analysis in a way that's useful for decision making, tries to reach the right people and at the right time. Finally, there's a broad need to shift from reactive to proactive action, a uh, need to move away from crisis-driven piecemeal approaches focused on the short term and toward integrated, proactive risk management with a long-term perspective. So finally, last slide, and then we'll get into discussion, which you're hopefully all looking forward to as much as we are. Uh, what's next? So we identified four key themes of, of what's next, what, what the trends are that we see coming in the very near-term horizon. One is a set of principles and guidelines for uh, governance of investment in agricultural land and water. So this idea of uh, land and water grabbing and, and the conflicts uh, inherent in some of the practices uh, taking place with that, uh, conflicts with traditional land tenure versus uh, uh, government structures, and um, also the need for this from, from the private sector's perspective for more security in the investments that they're making. We also identified, uh, in terms of what's next, harmonizing uh, and improving tools to manage water risks and uncertainties. I think we saw uh, a lot of that sort of beginning of groundswell for harmonization and convergence, uh, including um, as well improvements on uh, uh, thinking about uh, climate change in a more holistic sense and including um, things that haven't really been thought about in some of these risk evaluations, such as how we really incorporate catastrophic risks, and also um, that these tools might um, be more scenario-based to uh, allow for the complexity of some of these issues. We also identified a, a very short-term what's next as being uh, the demystification, we hope, of the concept of nexus between water, energy, and food. Uh, again, I think as some of the previous speakers this morning have indicated, um, there's not clarity and common understanding of definition around this. And also really, um, uh, we think some of this will come through some new stakeholder platforms, places to be able to share case studies and um, uh, reduce conflicts and, and help put uh, the, the concept into practice and have a positive impact. Oops, one more. <laughs> Jump the gun there. Finally, uh, what's next? We, we really saw uh, the, the near-term trend of, of launching platforms for, for meaningful collective action. Um, this carries forward on the, the collaboration theme for next year, but um, uh, saw on the near-term horizon uh, tools, uh, online tools, to enable stakeholders to link up um, partners, potential funders, uh, some really interesting and innovative ideas out there that uh, we think are really going to uh, help revolutionize the, the way some of these issues are addressed. So with that, I just wanted to, to close with a quote that I think carries um, through on this theme of collect collective action and collaboration. It's one of my more favorite quotes from a, a famous anthropologist, Margaret Mead. Uh, she was a cultural anthropologist in the last century. And uh, that quote is, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I, I feel at this World Water Week, um, that is a, a really hopefully inspiring thought to end on, and I look forward to having some conversation with you now about some of these ideas. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marielle and Kathleen. And before leaving over to all of you, uh, we are trying to do a very quick wrap-up to well, remind you. Uh, to be honest, uh, we know that we gave you an impossible task, <laughs> but uh, we'll even try to do it even worse, because now here are summaries of these summaries, so <laughs> bear with us. It's <laughs> just to remind you what they were talking do you, about. Do you dare to call it a summary? No, I dare to call it some words that I picked <laughs> up that I think are interesting, so I hope that you agree with me. Uh, 
Uh, in terms of achieving good water and food governance, uh, I heard the sort of need to prioritize investments and the shift towards sustainable development goals that are sort of affecting the society right now or our discussions, uh, the increased focus on multi-stakeholder partnerships and also the footprinting, the metrics, and also looking at successful cases on resilient water governance. Uh, there was also this issue of we need to maintain the water as a key political priority. There is an issue about measurement and data collection, and again, sort of the, this sort of strive or this urge for continued collective action on this, and to look at sort of the shared risks and benefits that can arise. In terms of uh, ensuring human and environmental health, what I picked up was this new understanding that I mean, climate change and development are intrinsically interlinked, and. Uh, well, you cannot use the past to predict the future. I think it was Niels Bohr who said, I never make predictions, especially not about the future. And I think that is something maybe that illustrates the difficulty here. Uh, there was also the issue of old things in a new way, like water saving techniques and uh, the need to guide, especially smallholder farmers in their water use. Um, well, the, the need to increase efficiency, of course, in our agricultural production, and that we didn't really cover uh, livestock and fish sufficiently during this World Water Week. We'll have to come back to that in the future. Um, I think that's what I picked up. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sure you picked up more. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm going to try to do the same difficult thing with the two next themes. Uh, on the theme on establishing water and food equity, you said that it is good that equity comes back and needs to be discussed and integrated much more than what it has been. Uh, you also talked about the gap between policy and implementation and said this is still very much needed to address. And maybe one can say, why is it not? If it's not new, why don't we do it better? So this is something that you addressed. You talked about evidence-based decision-making, and you saw a trend in it coming, uh, coming up higher on the agenda, which is very good. Uh, you also talked about the, the need for design uh, of incentives in the programming for gender approaches and equity. Uh, you also addressed the Sustainable Development Goals as the first team that, uh, addressed, and you said there's a need for, for higher resolution of uh, equity consideration. You brought up the issue on equity and food waste and those relationships. And finally, when you talked about what next, you talked about rethinking capacity strengthening, and you also talked about sustaining political engagement at national level, and maybe also on local level, if I may have that comment. And then we were very pleased to, to listen to the last film uh, talking about co the need for more collaboration. Builds up very well to the next week, I think. Uh, you said that, that what's new is the advancing discussion on the value of water, very needed in order to, to address the challenges we see in front of us, and also in the discussion on reducing food waste. You said that we there's a need for broadening the approach uh, and to also include a social scientist in, in, in the discussions. Maybe more, they're still there, but in, in a higher degree, I, I take it. You also talked a lot about harmonization of definitions and a need for convergency. You addressed that both in what is needed and what is next. And um, you also talked about being proactive and coming up with solutions. And uh, finally, to demystify the nexus, and maybe that is also part of being proactive, to really try to explain it also in terms of, of economic terms. That's all, but I'm sure there are more. And we will now open the floor to questions and comments. Uh, unfortunately, those of you who are seated at the far back, we can hardly see you from here, so you have, will have to wave very vigorously for us to notice you. Uh, we would also like to take three questions at a time. It would be great if you could state your name, your affiliation, and also to whom you are addressing this question or comment. And we would like to hear, sort of, is there something that these brilliant people and the juniors have missed? Is there something that you would like to comment on, on what they have said that could be put in a different perspective? So please start raising your hands. Yes. 
We have Tony Allen. I suppose that you are not too happy with the emerging consensus that seems to be here. You always try to question things and put things in a different perspective. Please, Tony. Yeah, thank you. Tony Allen from King's College London. Um, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I wondered whether I'd have the chance. Um, I think we've partly missed the point, uh, and it isn't be, uh, I'm, I'm not meaning to be grumpy and difficult. <laughs> the, because the framework of the uh, organization has been on the basis of science, which uh, with its disciplines, on the basis of the international agencies with their almost disciplinary interests. Um, we've, we've missed the point because f uh, food and food security are dealt with by huge numbers of people and they're all located in the private sector. All farms are run by farmers, some in non, no economic sector, perhaps in subsistence, but the majority of them are in small farms, family farms, and then up to the big corporate farms. And then beyond that, in the rest of the food supply chain, you've got the, the traders, uh, the food processing organizations, the ag industries, as well as the uh, supermarkets, and then finally the consumers. All of that supply chain is in the private sector. It's hardly been mentioned by anyone on this platform. Who manages water? 90% of the water that we all need is managed by farmers. So if you're going to get something changed, you need to be speaking to farmers and hearing from farmers. Even the gender thing fits into this framework. Women farmers <laughs> are the people that manage and allocate water. So uh, can I make sure that uh, perhaps you wave at this as a PS in your, uh, your findings that we do recognize that it's the, the, the private sector uh, that, that, that counts in this. And it's the private sector obviously influenced also by politicians. I mean, if you want to know why water is mismanaged, it's because it's got no price. And I'm not saying we should price water. I know the long story of that and why it's so difficult. But we do need to make sure that we understand that it's the absence of that price signal which makes the market, which determines what's happening. Because that's blind to the value of water, it's a very unsafe thing to be running things. And the relationship of farmers to power is also something to understand. In my going around talking to farmers, I never find that they want to talk to scientists. They want to talk to power. They've been doing it for thousands of years, and they do it very, very intensely and very well. So we end with that's what we need to understand, because the misallocation of water is mainly because of the outcomes of that political process, which is to protect the livelihoods of farmers, which we need to do, but without pricing in the stewardship, which needs to be done. So stewardship, who's going to do the stewardship? Not, not FAO or an engineer. A farmer's going to do the stewardship. So we need to understand how to price food so that we can also afford to have the stewardship. The private sector needs to be here. Finally, just I had great trouble getting the private sector here. I had deep involvement in two um, a workshop and a seminar, and I found no empathy with getting the private sector here. Thank you. We have another gentleman over there. David Wilcox, Reach Scale. Um, I'd like to compliment the organizers of the conference on doing a remarkable job of pulling in multiple sectors to the conversation. But I'd also like to suggest that this particular sector seems to have a belief that they do have inside those sectors the solutions they need. If you look at the healthcare market, you'll find they've completely lost that view of the world. They do not have confidence that they have the solutions. So if you went to the World Healthcare Congress, which is kind of a corollary conference to this one, you'd find the largest rooms in the World Healthcare Congress are the rooms dedicated to the tracks on social innovation and social entrepreneurship, where they've invited Muhammad Yunus and hundreds of other speakers to come and try to help them out of the mess that they're in. So one thing for the next year might be for all of us to kind of pick the area we think could bring the most value to the conversation and go to one of their conferences and see if we can bring some more ideas back. If you'd like to attend the Skoll uh, World Forum on Social Entrepreneurship, you can talk to me. I'll try to 
tell you how to arrange to go there. If you'd like to go to the World Healthcare Con Congress, that's an easy one. Um, they have them all over the world, and they all have these uh, social innovation tracks. Or pick one that's you know adjacent to you but isn't here. Go with these challenges and bring back some new ideas in addition to the ones we already have, because to be honest with you, I don't think we have enough ideas. As many as we have, as hard as it was to summarize this thing, I think we're still in the water sector idea short. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm uh, Glenn Diger from CHTM Hill and also the president of the International Water Association. And I have two questions, and it's really directed to uh, all four groups. The first would be, of all the things that you've heard, have you heard any breakthroughs? You heard a lot of things, but is there anything that really caught your attention that was, that was a breakthrough? The second question, I'd actually like the four groups to one at a time, not based on what, not based on what you're reporting, but on ways, what you've heard, if each of you would suggest one thing that you would recommend that we all do going out of here that would make the biggest difference and maybe not be repetitive, then we'd have four things that would really make a difference. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we had some, some good challenges here at first, and, and I think that was something directed to all of you from Tony Allen around, did we miss the, uh, the uh, private sector in our discussions, and, and how could we bring that firmer to our discussions? And also the discussion around prices, I can see that you're ready to, to jump on that one. Uh, so maybe we start there. Uh, did you miss the, the private sector in rooms and in the discussions and also the discussions over how to bridge the gap between the farmers and the farmer stewardship and the policy makers? So. Sure, I'm, I might just start uh, to Dr. Allen's first question on missing a, a pretty large piece of the value chain when it comes to water and water footprint. Um, and, and just say that we face a similar challenge at Conservation International in the work that I do. So I work within our Center for Environmental Leadership in Business. And um, I think the main reason why we're not seeing that kind of middle part of the value chain where the majority of uh, water and water impacts are really embedded is because there's, there's not a point of leverage or incentive <laughs> for them to be a part of this conversation as of yet. So the big brands that you see here, companies um, like Nestle, Coca-Cola, with whom we partner, um, Starbucks isn't here, but another partner that we have on, on which we work on some of these issues, um, they have a brand to, to protect. It's not the only incentive by far. They're, they're just trying to address certain risks and opportunities as well. Um, but the incentives for that middle part of the, the value chain, the ag value chain, just as an example, aren't, aren't really there. The motivation isn't there for, for that segment of the value chain to engage as of yet in, in my, from my perspective. Um, you know, we all also work uh, at the landscape level with small shareholder farmers, but um, that, that whole middle piece, I think, is a real challenge for us. And I, I can't say that I have the, the solutions as of yet, but I just wanted to uh, perhaps explain a little bit as to, to why that's a challenge right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and Danka, in your team, you brought up this issue of the need to sort of manage or guide the small farmers. Yeah. Were they not here? Yes, exactly. I wanted to refer because uh, in our What's Next, uh, we refer when we said that show stories on the ground. We refer exactly to that, that yes, invite, well, private sector or farmers. Session one session was very interesting. There was a farmer from Argentina and uh, he's, he reported what he's doing and that he needs reliable, on-time information and services from Hydromet uh, Institute, so as a public good that he needs that in order to make a, a better decision. So that was one example where the private sector was there and, and strongly made their, his voice uh, towards uh, that 
both sides are needed for discussions. So are we not talking the, the language of the farmers? I mean, if this need has been found to, to be there, why aren't the, the processes happening? Do you have any ideas? Did, you, did anything like that come up in your sessions, the ones that you were following? <laughs> oh, we should ask the farmers, of course, of course. I, I wanted you to, to comment on, on the, the second issue that was brought up around uh, uh, the solutions. And I'd like to say, don't only bring the ideas, bring more people next year that, that can help us with the solutions. But, but do you have any particular comments? And maybe we can link that to the next, to the next question around, do you have heard any breakthroughs that we can build on? So, so that is something that goes for all of us and all of you. Yes, Darren, please. Uh, I think it's on, yeah. I mean, I wanted to push back against the, the speaker on that because uh, whilst I think we recognise that we need to do more as a sector in terms of reaching out to, to colleagues in nutrition or in uh, the economic sphere or in health, I actually came across a number of sessions on the water side that spoke directly to, to the assimilation of, of methods and approaches and tools from other sectors and a, and a case in point here on, on the WASH side was the way in which the WASH sector is really transforming its monitoring approaches through the use of information communication technologies. Now at the soundbite level that's, that's smartphones but it's much more than that and I think that really has uh, an opportunity to completely transform the way in which we make data available, the ways in which we improve accountability uh, and the functionality of water systems and sanitation systems. So I think that that's, a, that's an indicator that there is a, certainly an intent to act on the fact that we don't have enough skills within our sector and we need to assimilate these ideas from elsewhere. And I'd mentioned in my presentation that you know, we had a lot of pointy-headed people from outside of our sector doing great econometrics analysis, telling us about the, the, you know, the optimum uh, investment options for, um, for the wash sector. And I think, again, that's another indicator of how we're assimilating uh, skills from outside of the water or the food, food sector. Thank you, Darren. I saw that Kathleen wanted to join in, and I guess talking about the optimum investment might be something that could. <laughs> 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 that we can talk about, I suppose, in the in the hallway in the margins, right? <laughs> um, I I wanted to respond to the the second speaker's point about looking for good ideas outside of our own community. Um, I I think from the perspective of using economic analysis to. Uh, make better decisions. I think that point is really um, appropriate and really right on. I think in the case of water, um, we haven't done a great job of using economic tools or economic analysis to improve water outcomes. And we've got a lot to learn from other sectors uh, and how they do that. The energy sector is a great example of uh, where demand-side management is a entrenched concept. Um, it's embedded in every debate about um, energy, and that's not quite the case in, 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 the, in the context of water. Um, so definitely, I mean, I think that point from the perspective of the economic analysis is, is, um, is well put. And then I also wanted to remark that I think your point about innovation is really important because I think a lot of the examples that we hear at the um, at the World Water Week with regard to innovation focus focuses very strongly on technological innovations. And I think we have to be careful not to forget about um, social innovations, new business models, new processes, non-technological innovation, um, and uh, I think new better ideas are great. We've also got to put them into into practice. Thank you. Uh, I think Lina also flagged that you wanted to speak to this issue. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I also wanted to push back a little bit on the two first speaker comments here because I feel that, at least for me, I'm not sure that I feel that I belong to one sector. And I think what we've seen here during the week is very much a lot of cross-sectoral approaches coming up. I don't know how many in here that only feel they are water professionals, but, but I think many of us actually cross many different disciplines and work across many different fields. We're 
all, over 2,000 people here, I think, uh, during this week. I think we all have a big responsibility to go out to the field, to listen to performers, to listen to business sectors, etc. And when we come here, all of us have to have this dialogue that crosses the different sectors, that surrounds water, but really crosses these different sectors. I mean, there's always an issue of who you invite and can you invite better people, and etc. But we also have the responsibility here to bring up all the different issues that, that we need to discuss. Um, yeah, I think I finished there. Thank you. Yes, Juliet. One more point on this, on the same topic. Um, I just also wanted to say that uh, I think that we do actually have quite a lot of ideas and maybe it's our fault as rapporteurs for not having expressed that clearly. In fact, it's a dizzying array of ideas and uncertainties that we have to integrate and respond to, at least in a governance framework. Um, we're talking about responding to the unpredictable, uncertain events that are uncertain and therefore we don't know what they are. So, um, you know, you have a lot of uh, climate change uh, changes, you have economic distortions, uh, you have trade, uh, and we're trying to develop models that couple biophysical processes with social processes. Um, and I think that in some ways, from my perspective, one of the biggest thing that we can actually do is provide <laughs> tools to decision makers to really do this. What does it mean to help people respond to climate change? Well, we, we learned about vulnerability analyses. We learned about early warning systems. How do you make that happen? What, which global climate models do you use? How do you uh, deal with the uncertainty even between those different projections? Um, and so uh, there were actually many tools, and I, I tried to name some of them that I heard about uh, this week, the Water Action Hub connecting stakeholders, um, many of the different uh, models invest um, using ARC systems differently with social processes that end user interfaces for early warning systems. These are the some of the ways that we can actually operationalize these ideas, and we we need much more. We do, but um, it, it is a such a complex system that simplifying it is now the phase that I think we're we're starting to get into. It's great. We do have an engaged panel. I think Bogashan also wanted to add something to this. Well, actually. Juliet pretty much said everything <laughs> about it. You're a good team then. <laughs> I don't know what's left for me. But yeah, that's so true. Um, well, I will say simply, I mean, we need these gui those guidelines. I mean, there's a request from the private sector. There's a request from the farmer associations, the water user associations, that all these people sharing the same basin, like one watershed, they need a guideline document, which simplifies and make them share it equally in a productive way. So this is addressing the farmers. Yes, farmers are not here. I mean, farmers are sharing the same basin with a huge beverage company. Beverage companies can be presented here, but farmers cannot afford it here. So we need to prepare a guidelines, these guide documents, which will help them equally defend their rights about that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And I feel, no, sorry, Danka. <laughs> well, I would like to sort of, not to conclude this discussion, I am sure it will continue, but what I take out of it is that there is some agreement, even though you kind of disagree. I mean, you say that a lot is being done, but still you say we need more collaboration, and that is probably also what I heard from out there. We need more collaboration. We have some, and we are working across sectors, but we need to be even better at this, and we need to put it into practice, and not just talking about collaborating, but actually doing it. And I think that is something that we would need to address also in the next year's theme. I would like to see some new hands. Oh, that was many. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> this is a problem now. <laughs> yes, over there, the gentleman. Uh, good. Hi, I'm Adrian Alcaide from Manila Water Company and also part of the Young Scientific Program Committee. Um, for the past five days, we have seen several uh, pilot projects, new schemes, new business models. But my question is, how come very little of these pilot projects and schemes were able to fly into a bigger scale? 
Very good question. Yeah. A scaling yes. up question. Yeah. Pasquale? Thank you. Uh, my name is Pasquale Steduto. I'm from FAO. I uh, wanted to pick up from uh, the report on building a water-wise economy where among the needs was indicated the shift from reactive to proactive approach. And uh, I would like to connect what, uh, what Tony Allen said um, and complement that comment to indicate, uh, let's say, to complete that uh, chain from production to the food uh, chain up to the consumption. Because I think, which is uh, completely true, what uh, Tony said, the, the farmers are the manager of the water in their farm. So the water resource is managed by them. But even if we make them at the best of the efficiency with all the technology we want, I think still they are responding to a certain demand, and the same way also the food chain. So in order to be proactive, I would add that one of the things to do is to tackle the demand side, the consumer, the last step of this value chain on the food. If we enter in the healthy and sustainable diet dimension, so the nutrition of the people with a strong educational campaign you know, that there has been a lot of campaign on the health, for the smoke, for several things. And we know how many obese there are in the world. We know that is, obesity is not only a problem for a developed country, but also for Africa, as well as Latin America and other developing countries. So I would say that this is an important point, that if we educate a lot the people to have a balanced, nutritious diet, without overconsumption, we reduce the demand on the whole food chain and consequently reflect on the pressure, reducing the pressure on the natural resources. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes. I am uh, R.A.K. Jimo from Nigeria, Federal Minister of Water Resources. Uh, the clarification I would like to have is uh, for category, the last category of rapporteurs, which is building a world water-wise world economy. And uh, in the suggestion for next line of action, we are talking of launching platforms for collective, meaningful collective action. And uh, the example of uh, crowdfunding and stakeholders dialogue was mentioned. My question is on the crowdfunding. Is it going to be based on voluntary contribution or a kind of agreed cost sharing formula? I just like some shedding of light on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I realized we did not really respond to Glenn Diger's question before about the breakthroughs. And I know that you probably have seen many breakthroughs. If I may, I just felt that the issue on the food waste to me feels like a breakthrough. The, 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 the emerging knowledge that how much of the food in this world that we actually are wasting and the opportunities to curb that waste to also, as Pasquale said, free up a lot of resources. I've also heard some very interesting uh, statistics and data about the potential to increase water efficiency in agriculture quite dramatically with not the need for heavy investments in technology, but to get the incentives and the institutions and the policies right, we could, it seems, double the water efficiency in a lot of the global agriculture. And there is also potential to maybe even triple or quadruple it. But then, of course, we need further investments. But this first step could actually be done with quite small and not so heavy-handed measures. So that's just my comment to the breakthroughs. If you have more of those, please. Can, can, can I add to that, or did we have more questions, Jens? No, I think we have to stop. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to, to just also bring you to the question around the consumer side, because I don't think we have discussed. We did discuss the, the waste problem, while we didn't say something around the consumer side. So did you hear anything about that in your sessions? So that was my first question to you. And then also the, the question around how can we scale up the good examples? And I think that was also addressed in the, in the opening of this closing session. So 
You're already on. Yeah, your I can toes. certainly <laughs> start in speaking to the consumer perspective on things, and uh, happy if others want to jump in on that sure. too. Um, in terms of incentivizing more consumer demand for more sustainable products, especially especially with respect to water. Um, I, it's a challenge, I guess is what I would say, but there is movement underfoot to start doing that. Uh, the Alliance for Water Stewardship, I know, was here this week, and the, the standard that they're developing, I think the, the ultimate long-term vision is that that would be something that could be re recognized in the marketplace as, um, uh, I don't know, I think certification, actually, um, certifying uh, that that the the product that has it um, behind its label it has been sustainability developed from from the angle of water. So that's one thing. I mean, I guess the the, the issue is and the challenge has been in terms of uh, creating that consumer demand. And I have to say, I didn't hear a whole lot about that particular aspect of things within the the sessions for this week. But in in my experience again in, in working with some of these bigger brand companies. Uh, these are really complicated topics to try and distill for your average person who's not a water expert or uh, an environmental expert or, you know, isn't immersed in these issues. And to, so to, to, to communicate that in a simple way that resonates with your average person, um, especially in the U.S., um, I will say we might have more challenges than in other places, is really tough. So I think that's, that's why we're, we're not maybe as far along as, as we'd like to be in creating more of that demand. Okay, thank you. I think Bogajan had, had a comment. For the second <laughs> one, yeah, that's okay, yeah. Yeah, but no. m Kathleen, why don't you go first, okay. Kathleen, and then, um, yeah. Thank you, yeah, if I could just um, uh, continue a little bit on, on that point. Uh, this is um, part of what we were thinking about when we were talking about and uh, what's new optimizing along the whole value chain. So really trying to think about um, the range of incentives that farmers face, which do are influenced importantly by consumer demand, but other things as well. Dr. Allen also mentioned um, the importance in terms of influencing allocation, the fact that water is either not priced or often underpriced. Um, so definitely, I mean, we, we heard quite a lot, I think, in the discussions about the importance of thinking not just about the production side, but also the consumption side. And I heard a lot of really good in illustrations and great statistics, actually, too, which I'd love to share, but they're buried deep in my uh, piles of notes, um, on how we waste food and how much food is wasted um, in transportation um, by consumers uh, in stores. And I think those illustrations are, are really important. I, while I have the mic, if I could, just quickly address the question about crowdfunding. That was really specific. Uh, thanks for that question. That's a really interesting, innovative approach that, that we heard about here. My understanding is that the crowdfunding mechanism is completely voluntary. Um, the idea behind it is uh, basically a reflection of the new communication and information technologies that we have. Um, that allow um, uh, potential new entrepreneurs to reach a much broader and wider audience in terms of potential investors. So you could reach um, a really a mass market of small investors, if you will, who might be interested in your idea, might be interested in your product, and they contribute small amounts of money, but you, you collect those small amounts of money from lots of different people and that's your new crowdfunding model, as opposed to going through more traditional sources of financing. So that could be one to watch. Thank you for that. And I, uh, you will have to rest, rest your case a little bit, Bogosian, because we thought that it would be fair to give each theme a possibility to respond to the, the last questions. So Darren and Melinda, please, and then we'll take you in turn. Um, to the last question on... To, Bova, to, to the questions that were raised around uh, how to scale up and also around uh, the consumer side. But also if you wanted to okay. have any other comments. All right. Because this is your final say here. Okay. <laughs> on, on, the, um, on the scaling up question, a good friend of mine um, in the sector characterized this very well. He said that uh, uh, pilot projects never fail, pilot projects never scale. And I think there's a, there's a degree of truth in that. 
And one of the things that I've, I've heard um, this week, which I think is great, and it's, and it's part of the trend of working on scalability over the last five to 10 years, which is uh, lessons that if you really want to operate at scale, you have to deploy at scale. And the, there's a UNICEF program called Shewa B in Bangladesh that is looking at behavior change, uh, operating at very large scale, millions of people being affected by that program. The Water and Sanitation Program has been looking at the importance of the enabling environment, essentially policy, regulation, financing, as a way to bring about uh, much larger scaled operations in the rural, env rural environment. And very quickly, a response to Glenn. Um, you know, we have an obsession about breakthroughs in, in our sector in the search for the Holy Grail, and I think you know, that a more nuanced approach is that you can take fairly big steps on a stairway. The big step on the stairway that I've heard is around, uh, in Bolivia, a program where the local utility, the municipal utility, was incentivizing bottom of the pyramid, small scale private sector uh, emptiers to bring fecal sludge into the formal waste management stream. And that's a way in which utilities can be acting in a much more pro-poor manner. And it's a solution for the interim before the utility builds out its system across the city or a small town. And that struck me as a fairly big step up, which we need right now. Thanks. Yes. Um, just to address a little bit the consumer side question, um, I've seen a very interesting development in the modeling of uh, the so-called nexus between energy and water and food. The WEEP model, which I suppose many of the water professionals have used for many years and know all about, is now being integrated and connected to an energy analysis model, which will then automatically pull in some of these demand questions that energy is perhaps better at analyzing than water has been. Um, the scaling up question to me, that's all of, we kept, I think in many pre presentations, we kept returning to this, what's happening on the ground? What are the actions? What's, you know, policy is very good and policy processes keep us all employed, but what are, what was really, really happening? And the reason that scaling up as, uh, even though it's not impossible, uh, pilots are about te introducing technological change. Large scale is about introducing behavioral change, and that is much, much more difficult than technical change. Thank you. Thank you. Lina. I think there are, uh, in relation to how to scale up, I think there are two sides of the coins that I want to bring up. I think one is, is that there is an ongoing trend of farmers that are themselves investing in better uh, improved agriculture water management technologies. And I think we, during the week have heard quite a few suggestions on how, how to actually leverage that type of, uh, of processes. Uh, this is of course where I would like to call up all my junior reporters and have them <laughs> help me in, in, in answering the more detailed issues of this. And, and um, the only thing I can say there maybe is there was a project presented on Sunday called the Ag Water Solutions Project you can maybe look at that, that they pull, pull together a document about where are these levering points, etc. So that could be one thing. The other thing that I think is quite interesting, also that has been talked about quite a lot during the week, are the large-scale foreign direct investments that are now happening across the world. And whether this is actually one of the new opportunities and that we have been very much been looking for, for actually increasing productivity in Africa, for example. Um, I mean, with that also comes, how can we, I mean, there's a, how can that process actually be guided and uh, regulated in a way that it actually benefits the local livelihoods? Um, I think that's one of the main challenges that can maybe merge some of the scaling up with the big investments that are, are going on. Yeah, um, I will comment one on specific on Pascal's uh, response or the question and then one which was not mentioned here uh, that uh, we are very this is something what we stated that it's new because a few years ago we were full of slogans that we need to produce more food to b feed more people now we saw the shift in discussions this year that and I will uh, write it <laughs> read it again 
Sustainable diet, water and nutrition. It's a common ag agenda for the next year. So we are now started to look also on the diet and uh, waste of food. And uh, one session which uh, I attended was very interesting because there was a presentation, uh, not a water person, not a farmer, not uh, any uh, bank or uh, NGO. It was a social scientist who made a research on the cooperation. And he made a nice modeling and formulas, mathematical relations, why and how people cooperate together. And he came to conclusion that every cooperation over the time will collapse, and regardless of benefits or the willingness or resistance in collaboration. And we need to re-establish every collaboration. So and cooperation. And I believe that this should be echoed also, not only for the next year, that is a year of the uh, water cooperation, but uh, in our efforts on the cooperation between different stakeholders. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'll try to keep this brief, um, but I, I did want to point out that one of the problems with scaling or transferability is that many of these solutions rely on political will and it's going to be extremely context dependent. Uh, in one of the sessions with uh, Conagua, from a, a representative from Mexico, uh, who has made great strides on water efficiency and productivity, um, said that in the Catholic country of Mexico, he was called the Lutheran of water. And that stuck with me in that it's almost a religious uh, exercise sometimes. Dealing with water is dealing with life, it's dealing with livelihood, and it's dealing with politics. And um, I mean, a lot of this conference is about politics. It's happening on the side, it's happening at the Flavor Cafe while we're in sessions. Um, and that is something that's extremely local. So uh, developing some kinds of guidance, particularly around uh, what I see as a huge uh, problem in the future, adaptive water governance, uh, providing standards and defining concretely what that means and how we can assess that are, are things that I think we're moving towards and uh, I hope we'll be here next next year. Thank you so much. boko -chan. And next year I won't sit on the left side of Juliet. <laughs> before, before you ask me the question. <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> uh, about the scaling up the projects, we had this session, the UNDP civil session on, on the impact measurement. And uh, this question was also in, in, in part, part of the discussions. Um, there are several efficient methods, obviously, to scale up the pilot projects, such as like in, informing media, organizing workshops, organizing on-farm trials, organizing uh, activities with, with the society. But the most efficient one is engaging the policymakers, decision makers, since the beginning of your interventions. If you create the ownership with them and inform them and make them question and learn about your project outputs, about your pilot site outputs, then the ownership happens by itself and the scaling up is, is much easier. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I just came to think of, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that the Chinese symbol for politics builds on the symbols for water and control, so that water and politics are intrinsically linked. I think that is something that we might have to remind the world about, but I think that we all in this room are firmly believing that. Uh, I would like to thank all the lead rapporteurs. You have done a great job, and all the juniors as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, you don't take a water? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>